everyone. Welcome to session 111 of the Behavioral Observations Podcast. Boy, do I have a fun show for you today. Almost from the outset of this show, people have been asking me to get Steve Ward on the podcast. If you're not familiar with Steve, he is the co-founder of Whole Child Consulting and co-author of The Inventory of Good Learner Repertoires, amongst many other books. In this episode, Steve and I talk about a recent paper of his called What's Wrong with Being Funny? A Clinician's Perspective on Humor and Behavioral Intervention. We also talk about his concept of task as reinforcer, which was written up in Behavior Analysis and Practice a few years ago. And then we digress into all sorts of other topics, including working with kids who present with oppositional repertoires. This is one of those shows that could have just gone on for hours and hours, and uh, we were definitely penciling in some opportunities to come back not only on the podcast, but to visit in one of our membership hangouts. So um, Steve and I discussed a ton of resources, and I've done my best to capture them in today's show notes. And if you like the kind of approach that Steve offers, he's conducting a webinar that's hosted by the Applied Behavior Analysis Center on June 16, 2020. ABAC is offering a 20% discount on this event as well. And so if you're interested in checking this out, go to abacnj.com and use the code ABACBO20 at checkout. I know that's eight characters, but <laughs> so I think perhaps your best bet is to just go to the show notes of this episode. I'll have all the links waiting for you there. But uh, with a few exceptions, this discount is available for most of their webinars. So again, hit the show notes for more details. Okay, this show is brought to you with the generous support of the following. HRI Recruiting. Barb Voss has been placing BCBAs in permanent positions throughout the United States for just about a decade. And she's been in the business more generally for something like 30 years. Like Batman, she prefers to work alone, which means that when you work with HRI, you work directly with Barb and get highly personalized service. So if you're about to graduate, if you're looking for a change of pace, or you just want to know if the grass really is greener on the other side, head over to hricolorado.com and schedule a confidential chat right away. We're also brought to you by the Behavior Analysis Student Association from Florida Tech. In somewhat of a role reversal, Behavioral Observations is sponsoring their annual student conference, which is taking place on April 17th in sunny Melbourne, Florida. This event will feature presentations from luminaries such as Dr. Sarah Bloom and Tim Vollmer. It's good for five CEUs, and both on- and off-site registration options are available. This is a student fundraiser, so... No promo codes, but don't worry. The early bird registration price is already absurdly cheap. So for more information, go to fit.edu forward slash continuing education. Last but not least, if you are in Western Mass or close by, my friends at the Hillcrest Educational Centers are hosting podcast favorite Dr. Greg Hanley for a full day of training on April 20th, 2020. The title of his talk is How to Provide Happy, Relaxed, and Engaged Treatment and to Provide Seven CEUs. So for more information, go to hillcresteducationalcenters.org and the banner for that event should be right there. Uh, we will have a discount code available for podcast listeners. That discount code is YEARN, Y-E-A-R-N in all caps. And again, you can just go to the show notes for this episode and check out the details there. So that's it for opening announcements. So without any further delay, let's get to this fun conversation with Steve Ward. Welcome to the Behavioral Observations Podcast, stimulating talk for today's behavior analysts. Now here's your host, Matt Sicoria. Steve Ward, welcome to the Behavioral Observations Podcast. How are you doing today? I'm great. How are you, Matt? Very good. Boy, this has been a a long uh, a, a podcast in the making. I think we've had quite a bit of email correspondence going back and forth. And even more so, I've had quite a bit of correspondence from listeners saying, hey, you got to get this guy, Steve Ward, in to I talk to him on the show. Yeah, so. yeah, it's about time. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so thanks for making some time this morning to chat with me. So, uh, there's so many things in so many directions we could take this in, and I'm looking forward to digging into a, a couple of different topics. But let's start off like we always do, and why don't you tell us how you discovered applied behavior analysis and how you decide you want to make it your job? Ah, sure. Uh, it was a little bit of the uh, make your own luck kind of situation. 
right? And that um, I wasn't uh, really focused on what my career was going to be in college. I thought I might be a music major, and then I realized I'd just be teaching seventh graders how to tune saxophones and stuff, and it's like, I don't really want to do that. So <laughs> I went into psychology, um, but without a, the, an idea of really where it was going to lead me, maybe talk therapy or something stupid like that. Uh, but, uh, so it didn't lead me any, any of those places. But one thing that I did that was smart was when I was out of college, I made sure whatever I was doing, no matter how low the job was, it was human services related. So I was for a while when I, uh, I got discovered by a behavior analyst in Florida, Pam Crisofori, when I was basically the, so, you know, a couple teenagers get in a fight, Steve, come down, break it up, drag them down to your room, uh, make them stay there for a day and break up any other fights we have and make them stay in your room for the day. Uh, really what, sweet job. Yeah. yeah, yeah it sounds like a lot of fun. Uh, <laughs> yeah, what a, what kind of facility time. was this? This was a, it was a center school, a few, uh, maybe five or 10% of the kids were physically disabled, uh, wheelchair bound and had issues eating and things, but mostly it was kids with severe emotional disturbance, I see. Uh, a public, uh, center school. So yeah. And it was, you know, looking back on it now, there would be so many proactive things you'd want to do. Like, why is there no direct instruction being used here? Why is there no fluency building? Why isn't there, uh, people doing a good job of catching and being good, right? <laughs> you know, why, is, why isn't there a big, a peer mentoring program? Um, I don't remember any of that being in place. I think it was, here's how we teach. And when we have problems, call Steve. Yeah, I think, uh, I think a lot of us who are of a certain age or older can look back on some of those uh, er early experiences with, a, you know, wishing they knew then what the, you know, we know now and, you know, yeah. maybe 20 years from now, it'll be the same thing. Gosh, back in the, back in the 2020s, <laughs> you know, there was no this. Yeah. Out of the other. When all we thought was you needed DI and PT and, <laughs> and there's right. a handful of other things. Yeah. Oh, wish we knew then what we know now. Yeah. Yeah, indeed. Uh, so where, what, uh, uh what school w w were you at attending at the time? Um, when I was working at that school, yeah, uh, that was after my undergrad oh, okay. and I had a hiatus of, about six or seven years in between undergrad and my master's. I see. But and so were you doing, time, were you working like the, the human services circuit at that point or? Yes, I did the Remico Anchorage camp in New York, in upstate New York. Um, and I did a group home for uh, profoundly developmentally disabled adults. Um, all just, you know, something related to the kinds of things where people aren't going to think that talk therapy is going to do much mm -hmm. necessarily. Right. Um, and, and the kind of things where people want to be effective, they're necessarily doing some behavioral things. Although I wasn't, was, I wasn't specifically focused on, boy, I need to go find behavioral things to do. I just knew I needed to be in that field somewhere. I see. Um, so at a certain yeah. point you went back to school. And so what was the impetus for that? Um, handful of my colleagues were going, uh, I had had my BCA BA since I think it was 96 that I got my BCA BA and I was liking that. I was, I felt like I was thriving with that. And then as more and more master's programs were coming and more of my colleagues were going, it was clear to me that I was going to be joining them going to that. I was like, no, I need to at least take that step. I never did take the step to doing the doctorate. I, I thought about that for a moment and then I decided uh, I was fairly happy with what I have here, that I have a lot of opportunity right now with my master's that I didn't necessarily want to put table too much of that while working on a doctorate. I see. So uh, what did, where did you end up doing your graduate training? University of South Florida. It was oh. in their guinea pig class. It started in 2000. Okay. Tell me more about that. I, I liked the program. I liked it. They, um, there was a, a handful of professors, a little bit of the regular, um, conflict debate between radical behavior analysis and, uh, positive behavior supports. And we had some of each, but, um, they did one thing that they agreed upon was that they were going to steep us in the classics. So we got to study, um, three or four Skinner books, in that time was like our real base. And it's, I don't, you can't get a much better start. Um, I had uh, Dr. Jennifer Austin was there. She was my favorite teacher. Uh, she ran um, the Skinner books and papers every week and discussion on those that I thought was uh, very enlightening. It was the first time, like in my, in my undergrad, I was 
half assing it. I was like, ah, oh, this, I don't know. I'm learning about Adler. I'm learning about this. I got the dates, I guess, you know, nothing really seems like it blows me away and that no one has the answer. And then all of a sudden the AV is like, that's the answer. You know, Skinner is a, when, when the first time you read the first 10 pages of a book, you're like, holy cow, this is difficult to get through. But then it begins to be, you, you begin to realize that he took the time to say exactly what he meant. Right. Yeah. <laughs> the sentence structure could have been awkward sometimes and things like that. But my man, it was exactly what he meant. And it just made perfect sense, perfectly coherent. I see. I see. Uh, you know, th- that steeping in the classics <clears throat> certainly was evident in the paper that I'm about to mention that you wrote on humor. Uh, it is very, very well grounded in the in the um, um applied and, and, and basic research. So, uh, I, I think that might be a fun paper to kind of jump off with. Um, great. And yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, let me pull up the title here. It's uh, it's what's wrong with being funny, a clinician's perspective on humor and behavioral intervention. Uh, and I will put a link to this paper in the show notes. Uh, and I just, again, I just thought it was quite brilliant. And I, you know, I've never, I don't think I've ever done this before in the podcast. I'm actually going to read a quote from it. So, uh, pardon me here. Um, all right. When a learner's insults are maintained by signs of anguish, a specific type of attention, insult contingent smiles, laughter, or humorous retorts may provide a form of extinction. Contingent arguing, frowning, or attempts to punish may be functioning as reinforcers, and withholding these specific types of reactions may therefore function as extinction without requiring a more typical, more comprehensive form of planned ignoring. Complete planned ignoring may provide an unnecessary blunt form of extinction. This is the part I really liked. In fact, laughter, smiles, or retorts may be more effective than planned ignoring by virtue of providing feedback inconsistent with subsequent signs of anguish. This may provide a refined form of stimulus control. So I read that and boy, did that resonate with a lot of experiences that I have as a, particularly as a school-based consultant working with kids with oppositional defiant disorder and all sorts of other, you know, kind of emotional behavioral challenges. So I thought it it would be fun to kind of dig into this a little bit. You know, I I, I really would like to love to hear how you kind of came to this point of view Were there specific case examples, uh, interventions and things like that. So let's start there. Sure. Um, probably in my first, uh, my first gig as a BCABA, as I was becoming a BCABA. And then uh, after I became one, I was in another center school, not the one where I was a bouncer. bouncer. (laughs) (laughs) I like calling myself that because, you know, I mean, look at me. Um, but so anyway, uh, there was a, this school was, it was similar in that there was not very many proactive things being done very well. And there was a lot of kids with severe emotional disturbance. Um, and I'm frankly, I'm just a guy who, uh, as seriously as I take my work, I also have a need to have fun with my life (laughs) in general. Mm -hmm. So once in a while where, you know, something else may have been called for, Oh, call a code red, take this kid to the timeout room. Once again, um, I may just make a sarcastic whip instead. Um, and, and this is, you know, it's not on the really egregious examples, but on something in that subjective area of someone's being a little bit difficult verbally right now. Um, and I, it just seemed like it worked, you know, if someone said something about, uh, I can't do this when you teach it like that. And I've, Instead of saying, you know, something trying to cajole them or some kind of positive attention. Oh, yes, you can. If you just really try or, you know, putting an X on their seat, like might have been called for. or could not going to get your point for respect for this period. Um, instead of that, I say, well, it didn't seem like you do it the way you thought it yesterday either. <laughs> <laughs> so what's the difference? Right, <laughs> just, right. just just fail today, too. That's fine. You know, and, and you know, you don't do that with like, don't you know, you suck. You don't do it like that. Right. Um, you do it with a little bit of a grin, like, oh, yeah, there's not really a comeback for that. The kids aren't used to it. They're yes. not used to that kind of a response from people who are supposed to be playing it straight. Um, and see. then a lot of them, right, They it's it doesn't turn into a, okay, let's have a, a, an extended banter session. It turns into this moment is not going to be confrontational. 
right? Yeah. Get a, a foot in the door and then we could talk about, do you actually need me to find another way to do this? Or can you, do you think you can get through this much of it? You know, see if you can do a good job on this much of it and we can skip the end or some other kind of negotiating opportunity might come up. As I mentioned at the top of the show, if you like Steve's point of view on things, he will be doing a webinar hosted by the Applied Behavior Analysis Center on teaching functional independence. During this webinar, Steve will discuss an analysis of how the timing of prompts impacts the development of independence. He will also describe what it takes to make a functional behavior truly functional, meaning doing so after it's been asked of, doing it without reminders, not taking a light year to complete the routine, etc. Steve will explain how functional independence can be targeted from the very beginning of a learner's programming and into vocational and inclusive education opportunities. Participants will be provided with an assessment and guided to score their students' perseverance and focus and select potential instructional targets. The team at ABAC is offering listeners a 20% discount on this webinar, as well as many of their other offerings. Just go to abacnj.com forward slash products forward slash teaching functional independence and use the promo code ABACBO20. I know that discount code is uh, a whole eight characters in length, so just go to the show notes of this episode, and I'll have the links waiting there for you. So <clears throat> using humor as a way to basically uh, provide an unexpected response that that doesn't basically bite the hook is what you're saying, right? Right. Yeah, that's a, that's an awesome way to put it. I know um, I know you had Dr. Winston on, and, and he gives some really nice talks about people, um, yeah, baiting, baiting others for uh, a fight. Like they really want to fight your, your ODD kids want this a lot. I'm oh not my doing gosh. my work today. Yeah. 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 I mean, I think that I, I, since having him on the podcast, I've gotten to know Merrill, um, uh, quite, quite a bit. And, uh, every once in a while I'll call him up when I'm stumped with something. And, you know, so like I was working one of these types of cases and, he 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 termed it a a, a confrontation seeking repertoire, you know, yeah. and I I just thought that was a a really great way to to phrase that that uh, um, behavioral profile or pattern or what have you. He's a lot of these you know kind of kids with emotional behavioral challenges uh, just have such a history of reinforcement and and so he says confrontation seeking. He said like uh, a, like kind of uh, anguish signs of anguish as the reinforcer. So yeah. Yeah, it's a, it, I forget exactly how I think it was uh, Dr. Carbone translating Skinner for us before I started my uh, master's program and, you know, talking about you know, signs of damage as a reinforcer for violent behaviors. And this is, you know, that's where some of the counter control of uh, one pigeon gets fed and the other one doesn't. Right. <laughs> and then this one wants to see signs of damage. So, OK, I feel better now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Loosely speaking. So, uh, yeah, when, when that's the reinforcer, there's. You know, there's there's so much you can do about it. I think one of the usual best things to do, apart from your basic, you know, you're not going to get to have signs of damage and your life's not as good because we have this point system and all that stuff is, is relevant uh, much of the time as well. But in addition, just saying, um, not only are you not seeing signs of damage, I enjoy it. It's almost what we call reverse psychology, right? It's sort of a loose uh, sitcom kind of answer for it. But it is, there, there's nothing consistent with you smiling like you enjoyed it that suggests that at any point in the near future, you're going to be really upset. There are some, I'm going to just go on speculation mode here for a second, but with some, I think, hopefully good uh, basis to it. But there's definitely... A, a there's people who can kind of pull this off and people who can't, right? Is that fair to oh, say? That's true. It is very true. Yeah. Very so, fair. so when you're trying to make the case for people to, and, and again, uh, it's, it's more sophisticated than just being sarcastic in response to a problem behavior, right? I mean, what yeah. I guess before we get into the actually how, how you teach people to do this, let's let's back up a little bit. What what do you need to know before considering this as a an intervention strategy? Um, I would want to, yeah, frankly, once you get into trying to replicate, you know, replicating humor, people either are funny <laughs> or they, this is their personality or they kind of aren't. And, and you could do some things like, 
I don't want to teach someone who's just not funny a bunch of knock-knock jokes, right? Here, try these with your kid. Um, and I don't necessarily want to set them up for, here, try to be funny sometimes after confrontation-seeking behaviors, uh, you know, try to be funny sometimes. I feel like I, that would be setting them up for failure. Um, the biggest thing that would lead me this direction, so it's not something I put in BIPs very often, um, the biggest thing leading me in that direction is a kid who I see would thrive with it. A kid, and, and especially one who is really hard to reach otherwise, right? Mm -hmm. You have, what you hear a lot of, um, as I was rereading my own article last night, Calamity's parents saying oh, yes. that, oh, it, yeah, behavior analysis doesn't matter. When, when they sought out a behavior analyst, of course. Um, but behavior analysis, it doesn't matter. You can take things away, you can give things. He just changes his value. He just doesn't care about those things. What had nothing to do with, before we started with him, he was confined to his room most waking hours that he wasn't at school. Had to go up there um, while his brother was out of his room. There was basically nothing there. Couldn't have a computer, you know, could like draw. And, and they would try to uh, make other things contingent, you know. Um, you could lose this if you mess this up. And he just learned how to be content sitting up there daydreaming, looking out the window and drawing, right? So, so there's, you can make an economy rough enough. There's, there's a, point, a point where uh, the math doesn't work, where, where kids develop other repertoires. I take another kind of a profile of, uh, and I'll try to remember to circle back around to the original question. We take another kind of profile with uh, some of the kids' responses to pivotal response training. Some of the really earlier learners were in pivotal response training. One of the early recommendations is see what they go for, you know, and then go take that and use that as the reinforcer. It sounds flexible and nice and smart, um, but with some of the kids in practice, they stop going for things. It's like, crap, man, I really, really don't want you to give me any directions. So I'm not even going to find the sock and shake it in the light. I'm not even going to do that. I'm going to sit here and just find a happy place in my head that you can't possibly control. You shrink them into a tinier world. Yeah. Isn't that one of the barriers on the VB map, if I'm recalling correctly, like, like a, a oh, work requirement weakens the, the mode the, the MO for, or something exactly. like that? Exactly. Yeah. It's one of the first barriers on there. Yeah. yeah. That, that's a great uh, identif identification. It's like, not I, one of I the like, I like this thing, but I'm not going to work for it and I'm content by work. myself, you know? And so, yeah, those are frustrating uh, situations, yeah. aren't they? Yeah, those are, those are. And, and with one of the kids I'm thinking about um, like that, the big thing was, you know, we stopped making those little things into um, contingent force. We made them contingent on tiny little things like reach or reach out to grab it. Mm -hmm. Right, found responses that were so small that we just got, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? We got them basically admitting that they were interested in these things. I right? see. And they got interested in more things because they were more cheap. But uh, getting back to Calamity, uh, which uh, is the name that I told him I used <laughs> about him in the journal, he loved that too. Uh, with, with him, it was all about the personal relationship. There would have been nothing we could have said um, this schedule, this behavior, let's tweak what the, the behavior definition is and tweak how often you exchange it for this thing. None of that would have mattered one bit. Um, all that meant and what mattered immensely was showing him the respect of being willing to joke with him, being willing to like, we, we set goals that we didn't actually graph, but we talked about graphing decreases in putts like behavior. That was how we talked about it. <laughs> All right, we're going we're gonna to go in. Your mom says you won't order in a restaurant. And he could very, very easily order in a restaurant. But, you know, she kind of crushed his confidence about things. Kind of told him he was bad, so he was. Um, right? So the like Meryl calls that junk behavior, I think. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I'm going in uh, to restaurants. And before we go in there, I say, what do you think? You're going to be a putz in there? Or, I mean, we have that goal for decreasing putz like behavior. This is the chance right here. I don't want to have to put on your, you know, in your report that you were a putz today. <laughs> and, 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 and he loved it. I mean, it, it wasn't, it, it wasn't meant to be insulting. He didn't take it that way. It relaxed him. He right. saw someone was on his side. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and he really, he really got into, um, got much more socially confident. Actually, one more great example I have to uh, oh, get into. Go, go ahead, yeah. Um, he was interested in things like um, 
space exploration, military weapons. And he was, he's not going to be a shooter or anything like that. I'm not, I'm not concerned about that. Um, his dad was military intelligence. So he knew some things about some of the trade craft, oh, nice. uh, so a little bit of that. So, uh, I was joking with him about had a spot of tail. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Basically he was, yeah, he, he was an interesting, fun guy, really lovely guy. Um, we were, I, I don't remember exactly how it started, but I, I taught him about yellow cake uranium to the extent that I know about it. You know, it's not a good substance. Um, so uh, I suggested that we would go in different places and that I would give him challenges for socially embarrassing things. We went into a GNC and I asked him to ask the lady where the yellow cake uranium was, right? <laughs> And she didn't know what it, what that was, but the, the really cute part about it that she responded beautifully to was that he was still so shy about this kind of thing that he couldn't make eye contact. He kept himself behind the display rack and he asked where the yellow cake uranium was in this squeaky little voice. And then he just giggled to himself. Oh my gosh. You know, like, <laughs> and, and, you know, she got it, even though she didn't know what yellow cake uranium was, she got how to deal with him. So. If you're in Western Massachusetts or somewhere in that neck of the woods, my friends at the Hillcrest Educational Centers are hosting podcast favorite Dr. Greg Hanley for a full day of training on April 20th, 2020. The title of his talk is How to Provide Happy, Relaxed, and Engaged Treatment and to Provide 7 CEUs. Here's the abstract. Behavioral intervention can be effective for addressing problem behavior like meltdowns, self-injury, and aggression, especially when a functional assessment of the problem is conducted to determine why the problem behavior is occurring. A number of myths regarding the functional assessment process, which appear to be pervasive within different research and practice communities, will be reviewed in the context of a series of empirical evaluations demonstrating the effectiveness and social validation of a particular functional assessment process. Longtime listeners can probably guess what that will include. That's me editorializing here. All right, I'll continue. Through lecture, interactive discussion, and role play, attendees should be able to conduct interviews to discover synthesized reinforcement contingencies that may be influencing problem behavior and then design and implement safe, fast, and effective functional analyses from these interviews. If this is something you're interested in, visit hillcresteducationalcenters.org for more information and use the promo code YEARN, that's Y-E-A-R-N in all caps, to get a discount. As always, if you're in the car or on the treadmill or otherwise multitasking, this information will be in the show notes for today's episode. All right, I hope you check it out. Thanks. So yeah, I mean, that's, you know, uh, an interesting way to recruit, uh, you know, positive attention, certainly, and, and in a very uh, different way than we usually talk about it. So it's... it's, it's pretty funny um i know yeah uh the, the probably like a, a question is perhaps surfacing in some of the minds of the listeners might be you know cool. well what happens if you do this and the kid just starts telling jokes all the time or asking everyone for yellow cake and things like that and i know you talk a little bit about that in your paper so uh why don't you go ahead and tell us how you program for that or how you respond for that sure respond to um, that, excuse me yeah, no problem. I, I do it, uh, as I put it in the paper, there's parallels in other behaviors that we've targeted, like man's is a really good example. Um, someone man's, and we need to get the rate of that up, and you need to get the rate of that, the way I look at it, you need to get the rate higher than you want it to eventually be, right? We don't just, we, we're not going for a rate of five man's per hour, and then we begin to tax it with, now you have to man attention, you have to follow post man instructions. Sometimes you can't man, sometimes there's a delay, sometimes we say no, all of those kinds of things that kind of challenge, that, that threaten the strength of the man. We have to start off with the man being higher than it should be. Um, so even though none of us likes it for the period when it's higher than it should be, um, I think humor would be the same way. It's like, okay, that's kind of obnoxious that you've made the same wisecrack to me 18 times in the last five minutes. <laughs> I'm kind of, I'm over that now. Uh, but it's not the end of the world for me. It's not like, think about all the other worst things you could be doing <laughs> instead of that. So let me just take the starch out of that behavior a little bit. Um, an easy thing to do is just say, you know, I, I'm busy at the moment. I just get my phone out and uh, sure, just hold on just a second after I send a bogus text. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So, so what else could the kid be doing during that time? We're taking some of the starch out of it. We're taking the uh, efficiency 
out of that behavior a little bit. And I want him to realize the same as we could draw a connection to OCD also, I think, um, which also goes back to another thing that Merle Winston independently came to, uh, that I don't want to tell someone if I don't have to, that's too much. Stop it. You're going to get an X if you do that some more, you know, the generic X. Um, I don't want to have to go there in part because it drives up the motivation. It drives, you know, the, the, I'm just saying you can't when you really want to, right. It's sort of like a form of extinction and extinction makes behavior. The motivation gets stronger, uh, for a while. And then we might also have some counter control issues that we get. What I want to do instead is gradually make something less efficient so that you decide on your own, you know what, there's other things I could be doing that would be more efficient for me. That would be not quite as valuable, but more efficient. Sure. Uh, so the, the, here I am, I'm busy, try a new one. You don't have a new one? Okay, then I couldn't control, it's, it's literally not funny to me at the 18th time, you know, so I can clearly control, here's my response. So if okay. and you just for the people for the in life. the car, uh, Steve just made a very uh, <laughs> uh, unemotional face, very, very, uh, you know, neutral facial expression as we like to write in our behavior plans uh, quite a bit. So oh, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. It's Eddie Murphy and uh, Dr. Doolittle. It's like, oh, ask me if I'm interested. Oh, really? Look, it's that face. It's yeah. Thank you. I forgot. We're also on radio uh, <laughs> here <laughs> or yeah. the podcast. That's um, right. So I can control what the the backup reinforcer should be, right? So I can put it on extinction that way, not giving that response. But I might also go model some other humor with someone else nearby. Or I might make another wisecrack at the kid that is different from the joke that he's been telling repeatedly. So like a new joke would be funny. So now we're, we're talking about the lag schedule of reinforcement. Mm -hmm. Just try some new stuff. Um, and then we, we get into some other things where assuming that the kids um, assuming that his program isn't entirely downtime, right? It's not entirely downtime. There's, there's work time and work becomes a time where for some kids that really need it, it becomes kind of crystal clear. We're not talking about anything but work. Right. And for others that don't need it, I'm fine to make some wisecracks with them about their work. As long as they're not trying to make those wisecracks 18 times in five minutes. Right. Give me a, give me a nice healthy rate and it's fine. I'll, I'll joke with you about your work or, or other things during your work. Um, otherwise those crystal clear contingencies really set it up. Well, finish this page and show me that you're done. And during that little window, when you're showing me that you're done with this one page, some kind of wisecrack might be available again. Got it. Got it. Um, I know, I mean, the, the focus of this conversation is, is not explicitly about, you know, elementary age kids with emotional behavioral challenges, but, um, you know, the, some of the things we talked about a, a few minutes ago sound like some good ways to respond to some of that confrontation seeking behavior. In your experience, um, what are, what are some other, uh, interventions that you've found helpful for, cause this is a really challenging population to work with. So I, I, I do want to take advantage of your experience in supporting kids in this population. So um, what are some other strategies that you've, you've found effective? Sure. Uh, what I, uh, I'll skip over some of the obvious, more uh, replicable things that I still also incorporate into some of my plans. Like there's point sheets and stuff like that and level right. systems. So you want to establish some sort of reinforcement system so that there's, there's some more incentive beyond just, you know, uh, a pat on the back for, engagement in some sort of, uh, pro social activity writ large. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And that's a, that's our, that's a basic intervention that it shouldn't be ignored. It's just that I think that most people already know that. Mm -hmm. So I'm glossing over that for the moment. Okay. Uh, I hope most people already know that. Well, Are you well, thinking not? Is there a, is there a, uh, this is a question sometimes I'll get is, is it, do you have a go-to points type of system point level system that you you frequently, employ like if, that you'll you know that, that's kind of easily installed um yes yeah i have a, a favorite system of course i i tweak whatever i need ideally for whatever the kids need but my my go-to system is one that i saw dr mcgreevy use with a kid 20 something years ago um that was a self-graphing circle and cross sheet 
So if you good behaviors are in circles, working out from the bottom of a, of a number column and inappropriate behaviors are in X's working down from the top of the number column. Okay. So if you connect the circles at the top across time, you have a graph of their performance. I see. At the same time as that, what I like about that also is it gives me the flexibility of, uh, I really like combining racial schedules with interval schedules. Um, and, and especially with earlier, more or more challenging kids, where I think it's, it's less about the fact that 15 minutes have passed or 30 minutes have passed, which tends to be sort of weakly connected to behaviors becomes, you know, that DRO part is, is not super strong, right. but it's capturing that moment where you gave them a sheet and they picked up their pencil without arguing about it. That's the moment, right? I, I want to capture that moment to give a circle for that moment, along with some kind of praise statement. It, it, it could be humorous or could not be humorous. Just, uh, those circles matter pretty quickly. I see. Okay, cool. I'll try to run down an image of that sh uh, chart and put it in the, in the uh, show notes for this episode. Right. All right, so we've established uh, the basic. I can hook you up. All right, cool. That. Yeah, excellent. Um, all right, so we've established that. So there's some sort of rudimentary kind of reinforcement system. Uh, and so uh, why don't you kind of take it from there, Steve? Yeah, great. So we have a, so time in is working better, right? So we want, to, we want time in to be pretty productive. So we maybe be a little bit more generous with that system than we, you know, would, would uh, all other things being equal, we would necessarily think we had to be a little more generous than a teacher might want us to be. Um, then I look at, uh, I look at the kids ABCs, the ones that I saw where I can see more details than might've been seen uh, on those little pink sheets that we have. Mm -hmm. I don't want to just know that it was work related. Right. I want to see when is it that the kid is doing something that may or may not be confrontation seeking when someone says don't, and I look at, you know, how often the teachers are giving the, the catch and be good. Like we just talked about positive attention versus catching and being bad. And much of the time it still comes back to that where the kids actually get more attention when they're doing something they're not supposed to do. And teachers default or parents default into that. Don't do that. Stop. And then because too high of a percentage of attention is coming during that time, and because maybe in that moment, the kid's motivation was sincerely about that. I want to climb the shelf and get this toy. We can't have him climbing. Um, we, we get noncompliance with that direction to stop, right? So I look at stop and don't as being very low probability directions, right? Mm -hmm. um, and two of the things I do with that is one, I look at saying, you really need to crank up the do behaviors. You really need to get things that they're going to do when they're not already on an, uh, an inappropriate mission <laughs> or confrontation seeking or, you know, trying to go get something that's not confrontation seeking. Uh, when they're not doing that, really get them hooked back once again, back to that reinforcement system and the positive attention. And ideally, you know, if, if it's something that's unique about us that makes it good, our, our attention, we're happy and we're having fun with you. That's the ideal way for that positive feedback to come for the do behaviors. But then I set up things where I got a handful more, actually. Uh, I, I set up things where I say, okay, let's not set you up to say don't when there's really no chance they're going to follow your direction. Yeah. But let's, let's set them up for some don't that let's change the context for don't. Okay. Uh, a really easy example of changing the context for don't is Here's your iPad. If, if you wanted some time with your iPad, which our kids do generally, um, here's your iPad. It's in between us. Don't take it yet. Don't take it till I say to take it. All right. A, a simple kind of a way for permission. What Paraholt did to uh, condition joint attention responding in kids with uh, ASD. Um, so now you have a good reason to listen to the don't because it's going to be like three seconds, eight seconds, something like that. If you listen well, you're getting the iPad. You might be a little bit put off by the fact that I'm saying don't, I'm taking control, you're ODD, right? Here I am taking control, but it's a really easy bar for you to pass. It's like, yeah, I want to punish Steve for telling me don't, but I'm like four seconds away from getting the iPad. So maybe I'll just give him a pass on this one and, and I'll actually get the iPad for respecting that he said don't. I see. That's pretty cool. So there's some easy, th easy kind of, uh, 
ways to kind of dem- demonstrate cooperation uh, when the when the the path to reinforcement is 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 both short and straightforward. Yep. Um, I'll look at I look at some of this a little bit from a, a molar perspective as well as a molecular. So another thing with with uh, ODD kids, it will stay on them for a little while, is yeah. that they're going to tend to say no or variants of no more often than they tend to say yes. Right. So oh, yeah. however we want to look at the relationship between their verbal responses and the other responses that follow, there's some correlation between their words and their actions. Yeah. I mean, and, and I would add to that, uh, there, there are various <clears throat> ways that refusal can manifest itself. There's the direct, you know, says no in response to instruction. Uh, but I also encounter just, ignoring the caregiver, uh, uh, continuing yeah. the, the prevailing activity that oftentimes is yeah. more reinforcing than the one that they're being directed to engage in, uh, yeah. walking away. Uh, you know, so there's, there's numerous ways in which, uh, you know, uh, it can be pretty people creative. can be uncooperative, I guess, you know, yeah. try not yeah, to use exactly. the word compliant, but I, yeah, that, that's another talk. I'll, I'll try to not skip. Uh, I try to minimize my tangents if I can. All right. All right. <laughs> if we have time, we'll come uh, back to that. If not, we'll we'll set a date for another conversation. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, looking at the yes and the no, and going back to the thought of changing the context, I'll look at things um, to just increase the frequency of saying yes. And my actual target behavior then is let's get this rate of saying yes and variance of it. Um, and then I'll, I'll set it up also so that saying no is really in your immediate disinterest. So it's fine with me if you say no. So that in that example, it could be just go back to the iPad example. I don't just say good job on that. Here's your iPad or don't take your iPad yet. But I say, do you want your iPad? And you have to say some variant of yes if you want it. Right. So mm-hmm. it's yeah, you probably do want it. You might still, you know, have some of our kids have a profound resistance to saying words like yes, then they don't get their iPad. Right. <laughs> right? But after some experience with that, you know, that they're quite surprised that they literally don't get the iPad the first time they won't say yes about it. And we talk about, you know, do you want this juice box or that piece of, you know, this bag of chips or whatever things you might want. Um, if you keep on saying no, you keep on experience what the actual results of saying no would be. You're missing out on all this good time. Got it. Yeah, that's pretty cool. And we'll, um, I'll get kids then if, if that's not enough. Uh, I'll, I'll find humorous sorts of moderately aversive things. If you can thread the needle, uh, you can set up things that they would like to avoid and ask them, would you like to avoid this? <laughs> and they say, no. Okay, good. Here it comes. <laughs> so what would be an down. example of that? <laughs> would you, um, would you like to, uh, avoid me flicking your ear? All right. So it's <laughs> not, uh, <laughs> I wanted to say a wedgie, but I've, I've never given a kid a wedgie. So it's, I'd like to say that I have, I haven't. Uh, <laughs> right. um, so would you like to avoid me flicking your ear? No. Okay. No problem. Here you go. Not flicked out my ear, but, right. um, something we can, we can pull off, right? The, a moderate aversive. Would you like me to, um, would you like to skip math today? Would you do that one? Would you like to skip it today? No. Okay. Here it is. I, I got see. your math. Got it. Got it. Yeah. That's, uh, uh, it's pretty counterintuitive, but it makes sense now that you've kind of laid it out. So, um, and I don't know if this, uh, is a good segue for this, uh, but a- another paper, uh, that you and I think a few of your colleagues uh, published in behavior analysis and practice a little while ago is is kind of um, the task as reinforcer if I'm not mistaken is that based it, so um, I read it I read it uh, a couple years ago when it came out and I thought it was great I oftentimes it, you know I, I think one of the things that's that that's fun about encountering some of these kind of little gems in the literature is that when it when it really mirrors some of the stuff that you've just kind of see in practice and it certainly did that for me. So uh, why don't you take a minute and kind of describe the the, the paper itself and the, and the rationale for doing it and kind of what you were trying to communicate to the, I guess, practitioner base by writing it up and publishing it. Thank you. Um, yeah, this is, I, I think this is a perfect segue into that because that is relevant for 
uh, I know we don't want to necessarily spend all our time on ODD, but that's it's relevant for that population as well. You know, well. I, I don't mind doing that because it, it's something that you know the 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 average BCBA serving you know little kids with autism, uh, uh, you know, probably doesn't have a lot of contact with. So it's a different you know different population certainly, and it's not that that kids with autism can't be oppositional either. So I think there's there's value in going through this. So just. Let it fly, I guess is what I've said. Great, great. We'll go for it. Uh, you think what are, uh, let's take a, a pretty salient form of task resistance. And I know there's people that might want retronyms where we don't talk about a word being called work or task or whatever. And just kind of put that aside for now as well. Hmm. So here's a task and the kid um, non-violently kind of swipes it from the table, you know, not vigorously swipes it from the table. What would, uh, and I'll make this uh, rhetorical because I'm going to drill you on it, but in your experience, I know you would you would have the same answers. Uh, what kind of things do teachers and parents generally do, especially when they're, when they have, it's still true, uh, however much I do with, uh, with the learner repertoires, it's still true that academic and language objectives and those kind of other skill building things are much easier for teachers to understand, easier for BCBAs to understand. Those are what fill up most IEPs and treatment plans. Um, and so that's the priority for the teachers most of the time. So someone, a kid just gently swipes it off the table. What does the, te- what does the teacher do? They say, I thought you were working for candy. Don't you want your candy? That's one of the things, right? They, they might, there are a whole variety of those kinds of, can we do this one first? Do you need a sensory break? Do you, you know, how can I get you to do this? You're good at this. Come on. We did it yesterday. I can uh, help you. I thought you were going to go in a different direction. Cause I would, I would oftentimes <laughs> see people insist that the kid pick it up, you know, and the likelihood of co- cooperation with that instruction is very, very low at that point. That was, the, that was the next place I was going. I started okay. with coaxing and cajoling and then get into the threatening and shaming and, and all of the escape extinction bits. And the, these are the two broad ends that probably, you know, absent someone's really specific focused intervention. Like if I'm training people on the wait outs on the task as reinforcer and some other bits, absent that kind of focused intervention, like 99% of people are doing one of those two ends coaxing, cajoling, or like low probability directions delivered in a stern voice that are, you know, not going to go anywhere but bad. Um, and, and so what I think we can do one is we can disengage. We can, on the one hand, refrain from making the world better because of that behavior, right. Uh, by offering reminders about reinforcers. And on the other hand, we can refrain from making our situation worse by finishing having a fight over the behavior. Um, and, and we do that by minimizing the attention we give for it, giving next to no attention, um, just going through the details, the logistics in this example. Kids watch the paper, I pick up the paper. I pick up the paper and I set it over here away from the kid and I direct my attention to someone else or something else. I go in my data book, I start writing stuff down. Um, if theoretically, if the kid, you know, uh, tries to leave the area in most cases where if I've thought that this was an appropriate intervention for me to do in most cases, they try to leave the area. I can just kind of put a hand out in shadow and they don't really fight that. If they're going to fight that, we have another whole level of things that we have to think about in terms of how much, um, how intrusive are we willing to be to prevent them from going long distances? Yeah, right? basically, if I understand you correctly, you need to sanitize the environment so that waiting them out is actually, you know, you're using um, boredom essentially as 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 the decelerating consequence. Yeah, yeah, I, you put it much more clearly than I do. Thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah, if the if they were going to be leaving, so let's let's say that we had total control of the room. We're in a behavioral clinic and we have a room totally set up all the stuff they care about then is up on shelves or is, you know, somewhere that they can access on their own. So if they do leave the, the work area, it's all right. I don't have to have a fight about that either. They can leave the work area, might roll around on the floor, act like they're having a great time rolling around on the floor, but they're not really having a great time They're Once again, they're trying to get my goat. Yep. They're trying to see if I'm, Oh yeah, I'm laughing. I bet you Steve's not going to like that. No, Steve doesn't even notice. That's fine. 
Um, and then, yeah, boredom sets in. They're going without their iPad time. They're going without their beloved Cheetos. Um, and I'm busy with other things. So if it, to the extent that it, it is sometimes hard to dissect whether that kind of paper swiping behavior, whether it's purely escape or whether there's an attention component, um, when it's really hard to dissect that, this is an ideal intervention because I'm not giving attention for it. And they're only escaping it temporarily. They're delaying it. They're ultimately going to have to do it. Um, just depends how long it takes for them to get bored. So our initial times when, the, when we're first training kids in this, their, their initial response is like, Woo, all right, I win. I don't have to do it. And then after variable periods of time, usually just a, five or 10 minutes they're like oh geez this is here i am stuck in world stop this this place sucks yeah. um i need to see about getting back and then when when they start to compose themselves loosely speaking um then i i still don't want to have them telling me off if i'm giving them a direction i don't want to say okay it's time to work now because that's a better chance for them telling me off and i don't want them to think they're doing me a favor by doing the work I said, oh, no, that, that's the, the spirit of this is, is I don't care if you do the work. <laughs> um, so instead of saying it's time to do the work, I say, are you ready to work? Because just tell me yes or no if, if you're ready or not. And yeah. then I won't give you the work if you're not ready. Um, and I take any kind of for, for kids with, you know, more deficits in communication. I don't need them to say, yes, sir, I'm ready to work now. They could just kind of glance my way and not negate <laughs> right. If they just yeah. refrain from negating it, then okay, you seem like you're ready. We'll try it out. And then and we get back to it. Move on. Are you looking for a new job, but you're overwhelmed with all the emails that you're getting from various ABA agencies? What if there was someone who was in your corner and could help you find the perfect job placement? Well, that person exists. Barbara Voss has been working as a recruiter for over 30 years, and her company, HRIC, specializes in placing BCBAs in permanent full-time positions throughout the United States. Barbara has been placing BCBAs since 2011, so she knows our business, and she offers personalized service to any BCBA looking for a new position. She also helps companies looking to hire BCBAs, too. Here are just some of the things Barbara can help you with. She can provide information about salary ranges in different markets across the country. She can help you write your resume. She can coordinate and prepare you for the interview process and even help negotiate the right salary for you. And best of all, there are no charges to any candidate for all of these services. When you are ready to make a change and want to work with someone who will listen to you and understand what you need in a new position, contact Barbara at HRIC. To schedule a confidential discussion, head over to hricolorado.com. Again, that's hricolorado.com and hit the contact button to connect with Barbara. You won't be disappointed. And to make sure I'm with you, you're, you're the, the, the person working with the student at that particular point is, is, is unbothered by uh, a, a no response to that question. It's like no skin off their back, right? Exactly right. Yeah. No skin off our back at all. It's no problem. I have other things to do, you know, and, and I'm not saying that this is the spirit of it. I'm not saying that we say all these words to the kids. We say next to nothing to the kid. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, one of the things I've been kind of coming around to is, is, you know, I, I was kind of joking about it a few minutes ago. It's like we oftentimes write, and I've seen this a lot in other people's treatment plans, but basically it's like have a neutral facial expression. And sometimes when, when people try to compose a neutral facial expression, it actually kind of looks stern. And so the yeah. more and more I've thought <laughs> yeah. about this over the years, I'm like, you know, I've, I've actually started to say, you know, I, I use the term look unbothered, you know. I like that. You know, yeah. almost, you know, even smile, which is a really sometimes a tough thing to get people's minds around because it's like, well, why should I be smiling? Because it's, you know, yeah. yada, yada, yada. And, it's, and, and, it, and, it, and that's why your paper on humor kind of resonated. And I felt compelled to read that quote because I just thought it, that it, it kind of tied all that stuff together. And it's like, oh, OK, this makes perfect sense now. And, Adopt a uh, Zen face. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but yeah, yeah. I mean, even look like you're having. Yeah, you know, this is not. You know, this is actually producing quite the opposite effect. You know, it's funny. Um, gosh, this is twenty years ago, maybe. A colleague of, uh, of mine and I, we um, we did an analog 
FA for an individual and uh, severe problem behavior, self-injury, physical aggression and things like that were clearly maintained by negative verbal responses. Don't do that. You're going to hurt yourself. Stop and things like that. For those well, listening in the car, I'm nodding now. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and so with this one particular kid, uh, and um, we found that contingent compliments on problem behavior suppressed like you wouldn't believe like they functioned as as as, as, oh, right. as type one punishment. punishers it was yeah. amazing it was it was and it was yeah. the, the data were clear as a bell yeah that resonates with me actually yeah i mean we I, would I, say i, I love you thank you <laughs> you know um it, it it was it was uh and i have to give i have to give my colleague cheryl credit because she was the kind of driving force behind this but uh um yeah, it just had. I mean, it was it was it was so counterintuitive at the time, uh, and uh, so yeah, so yeah, looking looking, acting unpissed, if you will, you know, yeah. I think is a, is a good strategy, right? Yeah, yeah, it's a, it, especially when you look at sometimes things they look like they're going to be a lot harder before you start, but when you look at how our, we got here, right? So some of the those two ends of the, either the coaxing, cajoling or the threatening, shaming ends, the extinction ends. It's fairly easy to piece together how those led us to where we are. And then if you know that bit, then, then changing to something more therapeutic than those isn't so hard. It's, it's a question of, you know, with, withholding like what Obama said back in the day, don't do stupid things. Yeah. Right? <laughs> don't say stupid things. Uh, and then from there, maybe we could do some smart things on top of it. Yeah. If we're lucky. Right. <laughs> Um, what other uh, other other aspects of the task as reinforcer uh, method that that we haven't covered? I know we just kind of went over it in very broad <laughs> strokes. Other 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 important aspects that people uh, should know. And again, uh, I'll put the paper, uh, the link to the to the paper in, in the show notes. Sure, but, uh, um, I'll, I'll get into some of the other sort of subtleties of it. Then um, I, I always like with with interventions. And, and I noticed you said we're, we're going to talk about the uh, the standard, you know, what are things that are overused or, or, you know, what are some flawed thinking in the field? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I, it's good I, foreshadowing. You're going to keep people in suspense here. So yeah, we'll, we'll get to that dying, in a few minutes. <laughs> dying to get there. Uh, in general, even for interventions that I like, um, that, I, that I tend to like, I hate the usual tendency for someone said, Hey, do this, it works. And then people just take that as a tool, like, oh, cool, I have a new hammer. And they take that and they just run it on everybody, like the article said, to do it. And if, if you do that, it misses on so many things. So what I'd love, like, all articles to do, uh, which I think I did a good job of in this, is to say, like, here's some of the times it's really not going to work. Try not to do it with them. And then here's some subtleties that you might have to be able to manage in order for it to work pretty well. Um, so the kids that these are least affected with, if you can't sanitize the environment well enough, if they're, um, seeking negative attention from peers in a gen ed classroom or, or even a special needs classroom, if they're successfully getting negative attention from peers, we're kind of stuck there unless we remove them. Right. And then we're talking about other kinds of more intrusive things that are going on because we're taking them out of the classroom. Yeah. Um, on, on a lower level, um, lower functioning kids that are engaging in high rates of self-stimulatory behavior, which I, I will sometimes see the rate of stereotypy or repetitive behaviors is not really purely automatic reinforcement. It's sometimes a little bit more, I could piss Steve off if I do this, or if I do this, you can't teach me things because I'm busy doing this. Right. So it, sometimes it has an attention broadly attention function or an escape function. And then I, I'm not worried about it. Then I just ignore that too. But when it's truly an automatic reinforcement uh, function, it's really hard to try to do something like the task as reinforcer with that kind of a profile. Right. Cause left yeah, to their own they devices, fun. they're fine. They're fine. Right. We, again, we can't stand better. against that. No yeah, one's bugging like, me. <laughs> I'm not working and I'm stimming. This is the best. That's right. <laughs> Right. So you either have to be sort of a new This guy, Steve, is awesome. <laughs> yeah, he's the best. He he's like alone. a vegetable. He just sits there while I do whatever I want. It's awesome. 
Um, a, another dynamic that I've seen is the the after I've removed the task of taking it just far enough away and waiting for readiness, you know, some kind of indications of readiness in your part. Some kids tell you verbally in a short while that they're ready. And then they do a, a rubbish job with the work. And then you take it away and they tell you I'm ready and they do a rubbish job with the work. Uh, what I don't want to do is another, I guess, thinking back to the molar level again, I don't want to rehearse. I do want to build upon the history of shoddy performance with the work. Right. So yeah. I would tend to wait a little bit longer. If I saw that dynamic, you know, a minute and a half went by, then 45 seconds went by and we keep on failing at this experience, then I'll just wait two, three, four minutes and see if, you know, maybe you go through a little bit more of a burst. Sometimes I need this. You need to actually get a little bit more upset first before you're like, okay, I get it now. This isn't a dance where I get to tell Steve I'm ready and then do a rubbish job or wait for Steve to ask if I'm ready and then tell him no over and over. I don't want to rehearse you telling me no. So I'll just wait a bit longer. Um, in that dynamic, a lot of times it is, there's the need for them to be a little bit more upset, like more sincerely upset for a little while before they really appreciate the chance to come back. Mm -hmm. the, the great news with that is that if that goes well, it's like any other kind of, it's very similar to extinction, really, right? It's, it's a version of extinction without being overly physical about it. Um, <clears throat> If that goes really well with, with a kid that I've been working with before, if you see me pull their work back um, for even just like really thoughtless responding, say you, you, you performed way below par two, three times. So I, I pull the work back a little bit. Those kids get like in two seconds, they're like, okay, no, I get it. Because I know what that means. When you pull the work back, if it takes three seconds or if it takes 45 minutes, my world doesn't move forward until I get my act together. So those kids just get it together immediately. And then there's no need for verbal correction, no need for shame, any of that. I see. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Um, so you, you, you foreshadowed this a second ago. Uh, one of the questions I want to ask you about is, you know, what are some you know, other behavioral <laughs> myths or that, that you see kind of just continue to get propagated in the field. Uh, I, I like the one about, you know, kind of like looking for a generic plan and implementing it regardless of, of nuance. What are right. some other things that, that come to mind with regard to this? Two of the ones that, uh, that I jump on the most and, and, uh, I don't think I'm going to have any impact jumping on these, maybe with your help, <laughs> maybe a little bit. Um, especially with kids with autism and, and I haven't done a lot of work with um, ODD kids recently, but maybe this is, you can tell me how much this is the case with them as well. Uh, but especially with kids with autism, people are using the first end contracts for most of the work. Most of the time, uh, this is where you ask a kid, what do you want to work for? And, um, they supposedly say maybe iPad and you say, okay, we'll put your iPad picture over here. And then here's the work you have to do. Um, and, and, and briefly the, it theoretically makes sense in that like great, this positive reinforcement involved, but in practice, maybe mostly when I'm called in, because I'm called in when things aren't going well, um, what ends up happening is that kids stop telling you what they want. It's the same as what I said about the pivotal response training earlier. Some of the kids, instead of being like, oh yeah, I was really interested in shaking the sock in the light, so now I'm gonna work for that and do great work because you figured out I like shaking socks in the light. The reverse happens. So as Skinner said, you don't know which direction the conditioning is going to go, right? Somewhere in science and human behavior, he said that. You don't know which direction it's gonna go. So it could be that they work better because you found this sock thing. It could be that they stop looking for things that they like. And, and what I see a lot is I'm really interested in expanding kids' interests, whether it's, you know, whether it's things like the humor, ideally something social, but even let's play with that toy, let's play with that toy. If we're using the iPad, let's get a new game on the iPad. Um, let's find a new treat that you like even. Uh, I'm really interested in expanding their interests. If you think about the matching law and you think about people trying to harness the value of these things before they're really, really valuable, then what's happening is people are trying to harness the sock and the light, or let's even say iPad maybe for someone. Um, and then here comes that the demands 
instruction weekends DMO that barrier again. Mm-hmm. Uh, what they're doing, I'm, I'm finding kids with like one or two interests and just by in 15 minutes of intervention, just by basically not working them, not doing first thing contracts and exploring what things they like and making them accessible with me, they have like 10 or 12 interests in, in very short time. It's just that those interests can't be harnessed on a first day work contract. Right. Right. They had to have some kind of uh, easy way to contact those items prior to doing that. Right. Right. And, and I, I, I will stop myself from doing that. I have an hour presentation that I do on work contracts. So it's I uh, basically, I, I don't want to weaken the man by doing them. I don't want to limit interests. Um, those are, those are the big things. Basically. I, I don't want to do that. Uh, another big thing with uh, higher functioning kids or, you know, those who aren't on the spectrum that have pretty high verbal skills, there is uh, too much belief even among behavior analysts that words are highly relevant. I think words are somewhat relevant. Like I said before, in a, in a molar sense, I don't want a kid to rehearse saying no too much. I want to get them rehearsing saying yes more often. And we can put programs in there like the old um, sure I will program I'm trying to remember where, what that's out of the tough kid handbook. Mm-hmm. I think there's something called the uh, sure I will program. And it's basically, it's really simple programming you use with uh, emotionally disturbed kids and stuff like that, um, where we make a special point out of not just trying to have them go along, cooperate or comply, whichever word you want to use, but to say, sure. Okay. Yeah. We have like direct explicit reinforcement for those positive utterances. I think if you have a, a successful event of a transition from this to that with extra points, if you will, for saying the words, sure, and they are going along, that kind of looking at verbal responses and its correlation with motor responses is highly relevant. That's highly productive. What's not productive is going back after problem behaviors and talking to kids about what happened and why it happened and what else they could have done and how people feel about it. Oh my God. What the plan is for the future. Oh my God, please. Right. It's torture. torture. And it's, it's, it's so ubiquitous, at least in my circles. Mine too. You know, and I, I, I see this kind of processing. And so my, my take on this is basically the kid is when the, the, first of all, it's an opportunity for the kid to practice uh, uncooperative behavior by not engaging in the process. That's step number one. That's problematic yeah. with this. Step number two is, uh, or point number two, I guess, is that I oftentimes look at those things and it's kind of like the, the, um, the POW <laughs> videos from the Vietnam war where the person's basically right. reading the forced confession, you know, yes. <laughs> and it's like, they're exactly. just doing this to terminate this aversive <laughs> conversation with an adult you know, and it's like the faster right. I do this, the faster you can go away from me and I can go back to, you know, avoiding and escaping this other yeah. thing that I don't want to do. Doing and, exactly what I was going to do anyway. Oh my <laughs> gosh. Oh yeah. That, that's such a, that's such a great point. I mean, the one thing I'll, 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 I'll encourage people to do is, if, is, is to, is to pre-process problem behavior. Yes. And sure. So it's like, all right, we're going out in the, we're going out in recess. Remember yesterday when you got into it with Bobby, I didn't, yeah. you know, um, you had to spend the, you know, you had to spend the afternoon in, in the, uh, you know, uh, in the, uh, you know, what would be the alternative setting, right? You know, it's usually yeah. some sort of uh-huh. acronym in most schools that, you know, that that's, you know, yeah. uh, some sort it of acrostic poem, you know, some kind of nice euphemism for something resembling a timeout room. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> you had to spend, you know, you had to spend the day in the, in the, in the cool out corner or whatever, spend the, uh, you know, appeared in the cool, you know? Uh, so, but if you do, you know, if you're, if you, you know, are safe and you do this, that, and the other thing, then, you know, you're going to earn X, Y, and Z. And, you know, so doing that right before yes. the historically problematic routine, as I typically refer to it as, I think is, is, is something that I'll, I'll recommend as an alternative, but I always tell people. And the funny thing is, I don't know if you get this or not, but like when I tell people that processing is a waste of time, like there, there are, there are profound looks of like disbelief, you, you know, it's like, <laughs> I don't know. How could that be? <laughs> I know, I know. I, I've, I've tried to soften my delivery <laughs> with that uh, message over the years. 
Um, but at the yeah, end of the day, it I, is I, such a waste of time. How, it is just, I don't know, but maybe we have biased samples. I, I try to say this when I'm trying to soften my message. Yes. We could have biased samples because we're not called in. If that ever works with any kids, then we're probably not meeting them. Right. Cause that means they're a cakewalk. Yes. 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 <laughs> Um, I'll, I'll, I'll use that sometimes. Yeah. It's like, you know, there are some kids for whom this is, this works and those are the kids that I don't get referrals for. You know? yeah. So, and so that may have some, that, that may be some sort of intermittent reinforcement for engaging in this process. But, you know, with, with, with these kind of, you know, tier, tier three kiddos, uh, right. you know, they're, who are, who are chronic, you know, Always. what evidence, what evidence do you have that this is an effective component of an intervention? And oftentimes it's not lacking there. So I'm sorry. I'm, uh, I'm getting on the no, soapbox I, there. So I'll, this I'll, is I'll, good. Yeah. This is good. I like us being on soapboxes. It's good. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> <laughs> Another way I'll kind of describe that for people is, is, is like what you said. If we're going to, if we think our kid is at least a candidate for benefiting from the response priming, from the uh, previewing this, here's, you know, a good thing to do now. Um, is just talk about the context as being as affecting the probability of the behavior. That if we do it after, it's one, they're not in an agreeable state, right? They're more in a confrontational state, more likely. And then two, when, how long is it before the next opportunity for the behavior? How much time do they have to forget? Versus here they are with something to earn, the continued access to the playground. They're in a relatively agreeable state. I can be on their side. We're talking about them doing something good uh, instead of reviewing something that they did that was bad. Yep. Another thing I see a lot in uh, when in consultation is that uh, I just mentioned it when you said that the amount of time they have to display the behavior again when you're kind of reviewing this in the, in the, in the post game analysis, if you will, is lengthy <laughs> and uh, I'll see kids lose stuff tomorrow for stuff they've done today. And that, yes, that just drives me absolutely <laughs> crazy. But again, I'll, I'll <laughs> refrain from another, another rant, but. If we ended up having a, a devil's advocate for a second, if we ended up having a well thought out proactive plan for a kid who could benefit from, um, you know, remote contingencies at some level that said, okay, yeah, this kid has enough control. Um, things are coming back too quickly. It's too easy. We might end up, I might end up with something like you're on this level, you're on level three, which is you access all these things. Here's the things that would take it a oh, level system. Yeah. Uh, and in that case, it might be the case that, well, you already know that electronics are like not available for a day after yeah. choking somebody. Okay, so just don't choke people, right? Uh, but as as a general thing, and when someone's pulling it out of their butt, you know, oh, I'm I'm really mad this time. So this time that I'm really mad, you just screwed the pooch. Kid didn't know it's coming, right? It, it's not going to have an impact on the behavior in the long term. In, indeed, indeed. <clears throat> cool. Uh, cool. I have another area for yeah. you. <laughs> yeah, go right. Yeah. Uh, uh, um, anxiety. I, I'm interested in anxiety. Is a real thing, you know. That, sure. That, we all experience and everything, but, um, even some behavior analysts, I think maybe are getting influenced by teachers, parents, psychologists, social workers, this as attributing, uh, too wide of a field of problem behaviors to anxiety. Okay. So anytime, if someone hits somebody, that's because they're anxious. They must've been anxious because they hit somebody. Well, what if they just didn't want to be second in line for the slide? They wanted to be first in line. They hit because, you know, it's just intolerance of a delay. That's not anxiety. Uh, when people, and, and I'll, I'll name it here, I don't like to poison the water much, but I should make the point. Are you familiar with the zones of regulation program? Yes. Yeah. I'm not a fan of it. Um, it, it in part because I think it, it it's oversold. It's, you know, it, it could have some logical application for some kids who are really legitimately trying to improve and, you know, everything else was in place. And we just kind of had to help them figure out, help them assess their level of arousal and come up with plans. It could have some, but I haven't actually seen it in practice work that way. I've seen it with kids that were just pissed because they were second in line and it's, Oh, you're in this zone then. And that means let's talk about what you do when you're in that zone, because it's, it's the only reason anyone ever would ever act out is because they struggle with self-regulation and emotional regulation, but it's not people that acting out works for kids. 
that's, that's a big reason they do it. Sure. I, I, before we call, before we get into whether it's pharmaceuticals for this or like uh, without trying to make another whole topic of it, I've done a lot of work with um, a procedure that I created called Calm Counts, which is meant for times that someone is sincerely anxious. And I know it because I'm the one presenting the thing that makes them anxious. I'm the one bringing the nail clippers closer to their fingernail you know, for a phobia of that, I know they're truly anxious. This is a, it's a wonderful, powerful tool for working on that. But what I, I wouldn't want is people saying, okay, so our kid that hit someone on the playground, they must need calm counts or they need some, whatever. It, it's not something like the calm count procedure is not another hammer to be used. Here's something in your toolbox of dealing with anxiety. The first thing in our toolbox of dealing with anxiety should be, was it actually anxiety that was the actual problem or was it just a simple problem behavior that functioned for attention? I get it. Yeah, for sure. Getting back to zones for a second. I, I, I would agree. <laughs> I, and I, it is at least in, in my travels, a, a fairly ubiquitous type of yes. intervention that and social thinking as well. Yeah. Uh, I feel the same way about that. So, yeah. Well that's, yes, <laughs> uh, I'm in the same boat and it's one of those things where, um, uh, it, 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 it's one of those things where I think it works for the kids who don't need it. Yeah, exactly right. You know, yeah. uh, and I know that sounds harsh, but I know I, Justin Leaf has done yeoman's work on social thinking and um, I'll, I'm actually making a note to myself to put some of his work about that in the show notes for this episode. Um, and I, right. that's a, that's a, that's a rabbit hole that I, I, um, I won't go down right now, but <laughs> it's good. It's really good stuff. Um, I'm a fan of his work too. Yeah. yeah um, I don't know what his work on that. So I'll look for that link. Um, where was I going with this? But yeah, it kind of works for the kids who don't need it. And, and, uh, but yes. at the same time though, I, I'm, I'm actually kind of, uh, I'm actually jealous because there's there. I mean, those, those, those programs are in everywhere. They're everywhere. Right. And, and so in terms <laughs> of like market penetration, and I don't mean that from like a, a profiteering standpoint but right. from a dissemination standpoint like um, you know uh and i know we you know it's, i guess I, I guess i'm kind of arguing against myself here at the same time you can't <laughs> just implement these things regardless of context or regardless of nuance or regardless of function so it's like you know can behavior analysis do a social thinking or do a version of zones and yeah. You know, I don't know. I wonder whether or not that's possible given, you know, all, how, how intricate some, some of these interventions. On, yeah. Yeah. I, I have some thoughts on how to try to modify them, but I, I, I thought through jealous is a pretty good word to use for it. And it's not, honestly, it's not profiteering, but I think it's, it's not like I'm uh, thinking about profiteering. I'm jealous of like, Mark Sundberg, the VB map must have sold, I mean, it's all over the world. So it's like tremendous market penetration offers a bit more flexibility for be, for people to use than social thinking and zones of regulation do. I'm, I don't want to use the wrong word for it. I'm kind of pissed. That, that's really the right word for it. Yeah. That they've taken a shortcut, cut out the nuance. People like, if you can penetrate the market more one by having like pretty drawings and stuff like that, which is fine. I could hire someone to do pretty drawings, but by taking out the nuance and I refuse to take the nuance out of my work. And that's one of the reasons I've been able to keep my work such a good secret. It's like, it's, it's not like, Hey, this works for everyone who has ODD preach it on the mountaintop. Uh, but if, if you're willing to do that, you can penetrate the market really well. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, I know we can go on a lot more about this topic, but, um, and I know you've already dispensed a lot of great advice for, for BCBAs of, of, of all experience levels, but, um, uh, uh, we're coming up on time here. So I wanted to see if you <laughs> wanted to, uh, share any advice you might have for the newly minted BCBA or again, BCBAs of any uh, level of experience that, uh, perhaps we didn't get to thus far. Uh, sure. Yeah. Um, the biggest thing I would say is make sure that you are steeped in the classics. Make sure that like, if you read science and human behavior, it doesn't tell you what to do with one of your kids in a SED classroom. Um, but it teaches you how to think about behavior 
in a really coherent way. Right. Um, and that's at the end of the day, if we want to protect ourselves from taking the latest thing from taking the social thinking and just saying, Oh, here, finally, someone's working on these kind of social behaviors. No one else did. So we'll just use this and run it. Um, and therefore being kind of, what's the word vulnerable. I think people are, are vulnerable to things, to interventions that are frequently ineffective. And if they don't know why the intervention is supposed to work, like you learn why that intervention would work or not work, by understanding Skinner and Jack Michael and, and a handful of others, then you know why things should work and you know how to figure out if it's not working, why it's not working and should you replace it or should you tweak it? All that kind of problem solving comes from being steeped in the classics of thinking about behavior analysis. Similarly, um, I, I'm a strong advocate for people having more than one supervisor and, and not as soon as they're credentialed as a BCBA, um, assuming that they still need more connection with other BCBAs, even if it's, you know, people that also are newly credentialed, just other people to be communicating with, ideally people with more experience from a variety of perspectives. Yeah. Uh, to the latter point, I, 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 I wholeheartedly agree with both, but particularly with the latter point, it's helpful to have a, <clears throat> it's helpful to have someone that you can call when you're on your way to work or something like that and say, Hey, you know, working with this kid and I'm, I'm a bit stunned, you know? And, uh, uh, so it's definitely to have, it's great to have that, uh, community of folks, especially in situations, um, you know, it's one thing if you're working in a clinic and there's, you know, a half a dozen BCBAs in the clinic and, you know, you can, you can pick each other's brain and things like that. Uh, at the same time, there are many of us who don't have that opportunity and uh, are working remotely or working, um, you know, in, in rural areas like like I do, where you might be the only BCBA. Uh, so, yeah, great advice. Awesome. Steve, we just scratched the surface on so many things here. Uh, and uh, we'd love to have you back on again to kind of dive a little bit deeper into some of these topics. Um, but uh, for the time being, I just want to say thanks for coming on the program and uh, look forward to talking to you again. Thanks again for having me, Matt. Appreciate it. Thank you for listening to the Behavioral Observations Podcast with Matt Sicoria. You can find Matt's notes on this episode at www.behavioralobservations.com. We also invite you to stay connected with us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash behavioral observations and on Twitter at Behavior Podcast.